There's been a lot of talk about AI in CRO and is it going to be a total revolution? Are we all going to be out of a job? Will you know, AI completely uh, take over managing and updating websites? Probably not. I don't think so. Welcome to the Treachery of Data podcast, the companion podcast for the CRO Roundtable, a bite-sized chunk of content summarizing topics that we've discussed there recently. So today we actually have a special guest, Shiva Man. Uh, actually, Shiva, I don't know how to pronounce your last name either. Manjunath. Manjunath. Okay, there you go. Sorry, I'm like we've worked together for like forever, and it's one of those it's like fine. you know someone through text, but like you never like talk and stuff. It's cool. I it's, thought it's we were so better cool. friends in this, but I, know, I guess right? we're not. Yeah. And, and that's fine. I just, you know, my eyes we're, are now open and I don't know if I want to do this podcast anymore. We were only coworkers for like two years. No <laughs> big deal. And you're like, you're Mike, right? Yeah. Mark. Yeah. Mark. Mark. Yeah. Mark and Mindy, <laughs> like the old TV show, <laughs> which is extra double wrong. But no, it's all good. Yeah. But uh, AI has been a hot topic lately. Mm -hmm. uh, I, w I think we've talked about it probably in some capacity for two months straight at the round table, mostly around Iqbal, you're doing a lot of work in using AI in a positive way for like auto scoring qualitative data research as a way to like speed up that process, which is awesome and totally something we should get into. But there's also some stuff recently I saw on LinkedIn, like um, I think I saw this coming from Craig Sullivan around People wanting to use AI generated users to do usability testing, which I didn't even have to like read all of the responses and be like, this is a completely terrible, terrible idea. <laughs> it's interesting because like what I saw, where I see chat GPT as bots writing for bots, like bots, a chat bot, chat GPT, writing for the SEO bots. And in the same way, like, I don't, I don't agree with it, but I guess it makes sense if you think about SEO and the Google bots are trying to parse specific content. So if you have a bot writing for bots, cool. But that's an interesting topic around having AI generated users, because unless you are literally purchasing, like, Bots are purchasing from your website. That's not your target audience. And you can maybe machine learn it. But at the end of the day, humans are a lot sloppier than bots. And I don't think yeah. bots will ever be like at that level. <laughs> there's, this, there's this critical disconnect in people thinking about applications of AI where they're like, the computer's actually thinking and, and doing stuff like an actual person when it's just really like I, and i'm gonna say this completely tongue-in-cheek but ai is really just plagiarism at scale and now i know like there's sort of not ethical but like psychological questions there around like is an ai actually thinking and stuff because i was having i was actually having this conversation earlier this week with someone else around Oh, well, right. You're using an AI tool to write content or put answers and stuff. And really it's just like copying information from a bunch of different sources. But if you think about it a little bit, that's still kind of actually how humans learn as well, right? Like you pick up information from things that you read and take it and collate it and reference it with other things that you are. So there are some similarities there at a, at a fundamental level and that's completely like that's completely going off off track here but yeah i think there's like two two major camps of where people fall into when it comes to ai there's one camp that thinks like oh it's a fad you know oh, why does everyone keep going on about ai and then there's the other one that says great we don't need humans anymore i can just do this right now i can just replace users and test um you know, test everything synthetically. And, you know, there's the truth is kind of like we're at some point, yes, maybe we'll get there, but we're not there yet. And it's kind of like trying to jump, uh, jump into this, this kind of, uh, 
new revolution almost, and then trying to come up with ideas that are way too futuristic and so, you know, that, that the technology isn't right, uh, right there at the moment to produce like the synthetic users thing. Um, there are different use cases for AI. And I think it's worth understanding that AI can be used in many ways to help in many different scenarios. So think about like project management. I know we're all big fans of like Airtable and the automations and Zapier, Zapier, or whatever. Um, these are opportunities for you to optimize out very mundane click, drag and drop stuff that's very easy. Um, great use case for AI, you know, automate things that just are tedious. But there are certain things like you can't, theoretically, you can help, auto, automation can help you with maybe data collection. And I've seen some pretty cool use cases of like using chat GPT or a model like that to help you parse through data. I think Google Analytics was doing that for a while. Like you could query Google Analytics and be like, what are my top balance rate pages? And it'll actually pull it out for you, which is a great shortcut to getting the data. But at the end of the day, you can't automate strategy. There's someone who has to go in and parse the data and an analyst. And I think AI will shorten the, the time. The interpretation that layer is what yeah. cannot be automated. Yeah, the, the, like the collection, collation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think not yet. I actually do see a path that AI will become so smart that it'll be able to interpret that data in that way. But I think we're very much like years, if not decades away from that type of analysis. And perhaps at some point we will automate out. We've only been 10 job. years away from that for the last 30 years or whatever, right? Yeah. I One mean, of those like, it's, oh, it's coming soon. It's funny, I, I, like not to get off topic, but you guys have seen like movies about the future, like Minority Report in like the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, in 2020, you'll be touching and moving things. And it's like, no, I mean, we're not at that scale. We don't have flying cars yet. Um, so well, those, some of that stuff is also rule of cool kind of things where it's like, it looks cool on the screen, but if you actually think about like the usability of practicality, like, <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, eh, people aren't really going to, yeah, it's not functional. Yeah. But I do think it's worth like looking at what is practical to automate, because mm -hmm. I do think like automation of reports and data and parsing through data, fantastic use case, but. There are, I think, many people who are so bullish about like ChatGPT and these other tools that will just replace copywriters. And I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. I think you're taking the human out of what makes brands authentic. And a lot of people will be able to see right through that. I think trying to think you could just, you know, parse a ChatGPT bot and say, give me top 10 test ideas. It's just lacking business context. There's no connection between your data source and Matt, just like you said, there's an interpretation layer that I think in the short term, like automation's not, it will get you help, but it won't automate away from. Well, yeah, or if, if you ask that question, like, where is it getting that information from too? Like, what's the input that it's generating those like top 10 right. test ideas off of? Is it just reading, like going out on the internet and like doing a query, like a query search for those things and then just scraping a bunch yeah. of articles? Then it's like... Yeah. Well, yeah, I could have done that myself. And that's probably like, because they're like top 10 listicle articles, those are super basic ideas that everybody's probably already thought of anyway. So yeah. it's like, how useful is that actually going to be? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, like, uh, uh, in, in terms of like the things that AI is good at at the moment, it's very good with language. So it understands like the context and also good at picking up themes. For instance, one of the things that I've been uh, um, really using it quite heavily for, and I've been kind of blown away by it, is just uh, just summarizing, like, because I, I write comics and stuff. So just summarize, like, a, uh, I've got this story idea. It's about this plane that this happens to, this happens to, blah, blah, blah. blah. Uh, what, what themes does this suggest? Um, what are they, what are the, and it actually comes up with some a pretty decent sort of uh, overview of this is how it's going to be interpreted uh, by the general uh, public and by the general reader as they read it. And um, so it's, it's very good at that. But 
and which is why like I went into uh, trying to uh, uh, use it for mining user re- uh, user reviews mm. and research and text um, but in some ways it works really well in other ways it really fall, fails badly it's the uh, the, the hallucination um, the GPT hallucination is a real problematic area uh, what that, is that? The hallucination is is well basically basically to go back to the the the, the roots of the uh, GPT chat GPT and the uh, and the AI it's a completion tool so basically it predicts uh, what you're going to uh, what you're going to say and um, so as you type in it would predict um, what how you could finish the sentence how would this person finish the sentence and for that you need a certain level of creativity. Uh, so, and so what, uh, and this, where this hallucination comes about is say you've got some, a user review, uh, for instance, they, they mentioned something, oh, I, I really like this, but I didn't like the delivery aspect. Um, but if, but GPT will try to expand on that, elaborate it and say, oh, I didn't like the delivery of this project when it got delivered, uh, some dogs came and attacked me, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff happened. I was like, oh, hang on a second. That wasn't there in the user reviews. It just kind of like, uh, it just makes it up, kind of pads it out. So you have to kind of rein it in, um, which is why like with the tool that I was using, um, with, with, uh, and, and another thing with user, user text input, it's very, very messy. Like people write very messily. They're not very clear and that makes this hallucination worse. So, uh, so the kind of like thing that I've been working challenge I've been having with mining user re- reviews and re- user research for themes is how do you tell when it's hallucinating and how do you tell when it's uh, when it's actually real I, when the AI different- goes off on a tangent and like starts making up stuff whole cloth like I've yeah. seen things like that happen where like you you ask it to like summarize some sort of historical factual event and it just completely goes off the rails of and like, when you're researching, you will create research studies uh, just out of thin air. So you would just create, oh yeah, in 1980, blah blah, somebody did this research. I found this to support your uh, your argument, what you're trying to do, that you input. So so that is a that is a real problem. So and, and people um, just accepting that and then just ca- carrying on with that is a real is a real danger. <laughs> We just have to make sure that there is some, that you need some kind of pre-processing, some kind of process after uh, ChatGPT gives you its output to make sure that it is actually uh, done its job properly. It's it's actually factually correct. So we're we're pushing, I think you're making a very good point about like authenticity versus automation at scale. And like, I think it's it's worth to understand on the business side, there's probably trade-offs to be made that perhaps, you know, content at scale is worth the perceived maybe lack of authenticity in certain regards. But I'm thinking about this on the user side. Like, there are so many times where to, I, I, uh, I discovered this tool that's a LinkedIn post writer for you. So I literally, you plug in a query. It's basically ChatGPT, but you basically like, you plug in, experimentation best practices and it just writes a whole linkedin post with like 15 hashtags and it sounds like something i would read on linkedin and it when i read it i'm like this is just it feels so inauthentic and i'm actually curious how many people on linkedin are actually writing their own content now and i think it's easy to know if i wrote something because i have a certain style i have a certain way of doing it maybe automation will get to there but in the same way you're talking about like reviews on websites and if they're spelling mistakes you know it's probably written by someone or if like someone's writing it in all caps you're like that's that's someone who is like a boomer who doesn't understand caps lock was on or his purpose i don't know like do you understand that there's some authenticity regarding that i think there's a trade-off that people aren't recognizing about automation versus authenticity in ai that like if i see a bunch of reviews and they look so expertly crafted that like someone ran it through a Grammarly, I have no trust in it. In the same way that if I go to like a brand site and I see 
it's a five star rating with like 300 reviews and every single one of them is five star. I'm like, all right, they're just they just paid people for reviews or they're incentivizing them with a coupon and there's a lack of authenticity. I'm guessing you guys probably feel similarly like there is there is a turning point where AI will be so oversaturated that people will be like, I, I need authenticity. I don't want I don't want to deal with like a her type life where I'm literally just dating a robot. Or the movie. The movie, yeah. Yeah. Just to yes. just to make sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um but yeah, what do you guys think about that? Like authenticity versus AI automation. That's a fantastic point. And even before getting into AI, like just referencing reviews, like mm -hmm. there's now instead of, you know, a review farm where people are being paid pennies to spam write reviews, just cut out the middleman and just write them with yeah. AI. Like I'm I'm already well past the point of like looking at a product and like evaluating the number of reviews on something where it's like oh if this thing has like 5000 reviews I'm like well that's that's bullshit yeah like i don't care like there's there's so many there's so much just chuff in there that there's no way i'm going to get through all of those i need a i would need a filtration mechanism on the reviews and use chat gpt authenticity to filter the is chat GPT reviews. <laughs> right authenticity is exactly what you're looking so i'm looking for some way to like dig through those like at the very least like verified purchaser or something like that to be like i want to at least read a review from an actual person like my assumption now is that most reviews are ge like generated in some way they're not, they're inauthentic I think uh, authenticity is going to get harder and harder to to kind of determine because already right now you've got tools like Langchain and Auto GPT, which basically uh, chain um, chain lots of different things together, lots of different APIs and tools together, including uh, Chat GPT as the brain, and then uh, all of these other services and stuff, including training the the AI on your own texts. So it kind of matches your your authentic voice pretty closely, in fact. And you can probably even get it to sprinkle in some spelling mistakes uh, just, to, just to kind of, um, you know, make it, give it that extra level of, uh, you know, oh, yeah, this is, this is a mistake there. Is, was it a AI Matt doesn't make spelling mistakes. Uh, yeah. but Because but, I, I go in and correct them. But the, but, the uh, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, like I, I, I haven't, I've got, I haven't got access to GPT four yet. Like I'm waiting for the API access to it. So I've, I've, I hear it's really good, but we know that GPT five is on the wings, and I know that the these learning models are that are progressing at a stupendous rate. So you got like, um, you know, have you guys used? Um, are you, you guys are developers. You do a little bit of development work. Do you do? Have you used GitHub Copilot or Code Whisperer. It no. is it is game. It, 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 like I was I was kind of using it quite recently. Uh, got into it, and where basically you start writing code. Like you can say, uh, say I was I was trying to write a function, and the function was you know, got one, two, three, four, five these numbers, and I wanted to pad it out with you know zero zero one zero zero two etc. And this kind of thing is called padding. So I started writing function and give it a name padding and auto complete sort of uh, kicked in and said, okay, here's the function you need. And that sure as hell, that, that is the function that, that I needed right there. And it works, works basically in within, uh, with context of the code that you've written. Uh, so keeping con uh, consistency with the code that you've written. And that is just like, you know, the first, this is just like the first version, the next versions are coming out. So I think like the, is that actually writing code to some degree for yeah, you, or is it, or right. is it just like a really advanced autocomplete? It, it's a really advanced autocomplete, but you can just get it to write the code for you. So you can just say, uh, in the comments, you can say, oh, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm trying to achieve basically. And, uh, and then it would just, it would just spit out the, um, the, 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 the code that you need. And if you've got like, um, if it's part of an app, uh, 
then it takes context into, yeah, you've declared these variables high up. So we're going to reuse these variables here and, and keep consistency with that. And, um, so I think that like, um, you know, I've, I've drifted away from the authenticity, uh, sort of angle, but it, it's, it's kind of the, these tools and the way that they're, they're progressing. Like imagine you're now working in Photoshop or Figma. Uh, and you're, you're kind of doing a web design and, and then autocomplete kicks in for Figma and says, Hey, it looks like you're trying to design this kind of page. Here is something that's pre-designed for you. Accept. Boom. It's, it's done. I think that's kind of, you know, pretty close to, uh, to being with us. Um, I'll, I'll push back on that. I think there's a perception that. Tools like what you described, this this code, GitHub, Copilot thing. I think these are tools that are like what a spatula is in cooking. So you could use your hand to flip a burger. Beer, okay, that's a bad example. That's a really bad example. Um, I don't know. I see it as... I see it... I'm, not, I'm hungry, as you could tell. I think there's an interesting idea around tools augmenting and helping just like we talked about tools yes. will help you get 80 percent of the way there but i think there's a misconception that these tools will get you and effectively replace people it'll write the code no 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 we have supervisors mm. because we know that those supervisors are accountable but these supervisors generally have to be able to know how to do everything yeah we yeah. see it as a calculator yeah. like when you're in college you can use a calculator because you don't need to know like, you know how to do one plus five equals six or, or advanced calculus. You need to know how to do it fundamentally. But a calculator makes it easier. Doctors. Doctors can use, you know, can do everything as they need to with the tools. But using a robot makes precision a lot easier and mitigates risk. So it's like, are you going to automate surgeries away from doctors? Probably not. You're still going to have a chief doctor or someone that oversees it. I just want to, like, my personal opinion is that these tools are just, they're great to help, but they're not going to eliminate the need for someone to know how to do everything. Because, like, dude, God forbid you have a power outage and you're in the middle of a surgery. Like, wh I guess they're going to have backup generators. But, like, I don't know. What happens if the automation breaks mid-surgery? Are you just going to be like, oh, I guess we, we automate it out? No, you're going to still need someone to come in and do those things. I, what do you guys think? Do you think there will be roles that are eventually taken away? Or is it going to be something that your job is going to be managing the automation and being accountable for the automation? There's a bit of a meta conversation here as well. And like, if you look at the history of automation and, and work output efficiency, like it didn't, those things don't eliminate jobs. They just transform jobs or make it so that one person can do more. And we, we haven't seen a reduction in like the work week or anything like that. It's just that workers are expected to produce higher quantities of output and tools like this are just another way to supplement or push forward with those things. I think augmentation was kind of like the key, key thing. Uh, they mentioned there. I think at, at this precise moment where we are, augmentation is 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 the is what AI is is gonna is gonna do. It kind of just it, it's just kind of like a buddy to help you get things done a little bit quicker, um, and uh, and so so to make tasks easier. But you still need to have that sort of knowledge. Like I still need to know when it's right in the code for me that it's not hallucinating that code and that code works and that when there's like little things uh, um, uh, kind of misspelled or not not quite correct, I know that and I can correct it. So uh, I think the, yeah, augmentation is kind of where it is at the moment. Um, whether or not that we will be at a place where it kind of takes over completely, there's a lot of people who do believe that it will. There's a there's a thing that Dennis shared on LinkedIn. Uh, the guys who created the social dilemma, uh, um, the the Netflix uh, thing. So they uh, a documentary. 
So they were saying that this AI is like the next sort of, we're not ready for it yet. It just came out of the blue, came out of nowhere. And it's going to, it's going to change the way we interact with, um, with the world, with the internet, the same way that social media kind of changed the way that, um, you know, people interact with their devices and interact with people. So yeah. I think it's kind of being hyperbolic for, for a minute there. Um, and going back to like authenticity, you, we, you might end up getting to a point where like people are using AI to generate so much content that it pushes people out of digital spaces. Cause there's like, there's just so much junk mm -hmm. to wade through that like, this just isn't worth my time. And I don't have tools like, like, right. The AI is generating tons of output that you can, then you have to use an AI to interpret, to, to summarize back in. And, and it's like, just cut out the middleman and just have an, a conversation with actual people instead. It's kind of like, I don't know if you guys go to concerts, but one of the things I cannot stand is people who go to concerts who record it on their phone and they're like, they're recording it to show other people rather than be yes. present in the moment. And I think that's a societal thing that there is a lot of lack of authenticity in society that's being furthered by social media that chat, chat GPT and all the AI bots will continue to make it further. But Matt, I totally agree. I think there's going to be a pendulum swing back that like people are so sick of everything being a bot that dude, like, is it possible that your therapist in the next 10 years is going to be a chat bot? It's possible, right? It might be better that like, I don't know, I've been seeing some stuff like AI is being able to detect like cancer in like x-rays better than most doctors. I might be making that up, but I read it somewhere that like, that's a thing. So I don't know, man. I, I think that that's, it will find, right now it's like, there's probably a replicatability issue there where it's like that's a really interesting news story but then if you prop if you peel the layers back it's like oh this worked one time small sample size yeah yeah exactly right 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 yeah but i do think like it's right now uh iqbal i think you were kind of saying this like chat gbt is the name of the game just like social media was the name of the game back in the day but then it was everywhere and then it'll start to just slowly deflate and then find its niche where it needs to be but because people are so excited about it um people are like this is great so i'd equate it to like the discovery of radium where like one, once that was like sort of scientifically established and popularized people tried to capitalize on it without understanding the risks involved in like providing and distributing radium so you would have things like radium uh, uh, tonics and stuff like like you know drink radium to get you know effervescent and energy without like you know and so there was a like just a, a, a lack of understanding of, like this stuff is radioactive and will actually kill you not that like like chat gpt and ai is radioactive or anything but along those same lines of like just tr take taking advantage of something that's like hot in terms of like popular in the zeitgeist and figuring out what works and what doesn't with it. And eventually you run it, like people are going to run into like the walls of like, here's the actual risks of doing this thing. Matt, you weren't like going back to what you're saying before, but you see you saying those hyperbolic, hyperbolic. I don't think you're being hyperbolic enough. So let, let me, let me take on this, uh, hyperbolic thing. So if, I, I reckon with, uh, AI is, is, is definitely here to stay. Basically. Yeah. I think it's going to be integrated in pretty much every single tool that we, yeah. uh, that we use. I think it's, it's probably going to change the way we interact with computers. Uh, I think, you know, the operating systems are going to change browser. I think, you know, browser is due an overhaul. I think websites are going to change. I think there's, uh, there's going to be whole lot of change in the way we interact with, uh, with computers, uh, um, completely, whether or not that kind of, you know, we get the Terminator sort of Armageddon, uh, thing happening. I think there, you know, I think there, there, there is a possibility that is, is, um, AI is going to cause some deaths because we're going to give it 
a lot of responsibility just by the sheer scale of which we, we give it that responsibility. Uh, it's, it's bound to happen. Uh, it's going to have bugs. There's... Yeah, it's going to have bugs. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to have biases because it's trained on data. Uh, people are going to, people are going to think it's objective because it's, it's AR. No, no, no. It's not objective. It's just trained. The inputs are not yeah. objective. <laughs> <laughs> So whatever the inputs are, it's, it's, it's yeah. kind of goes, uh, goes that way. So, uh, so yeah, it, I think, um, I, I think like we, I, I think we are going to, uh, like our kids are going to inherit a very different sort of, um, sort of world in, in a way, you know, there's a generational proficiency there, right? Uh, like yeah. it's the, it's a technology that's coming of age while we're adults. So we're not going to have as good of a grasp on it as the next generation, right? And that's that's a common cyclical occurrence, right? Like we're the computer gen, right? Like we grew up in, with computers, so we understand better how to use them. Say like our parents or our grandparents and things like that. So you know, our kids will probably be able to better deal with AI than we are. You know, and what do you guys? I, well, I there, there's also there's also only four potential outcomes of, of AI. You're either going to have uh, Terminators, Matrix, Borg, or Grey Goo. Like, those are the only four possible outcomes. That Ooh, may be the that? nerdiest thing I've ever heard you say. <laughs> what, was what was the last one? Grey Goo. Grey so that's like, that's like, nan that's like, Grey Goo is like a nanomachine cloud self-propagating and just consuming all uh, matter and turning it all into gray goo. So yeah, like, I'm, I'm just like yeah, like Horizon Zero Dawn type situation. So I like that's the well, all of the points are pessimistic. Basically, <laughs> you don't yeah. that sort of optimistic yeah. endpoint. Very scared. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I push on this with you guys? So I think I want to understand your perspectives on where AI fits into experimentation because I know we're talking about it as like a conceptual thing with like society. But I'm curious about how you guys think AI, like ChatGPT, or even just the concept of machine learning can fit into experimentation. One of the things that I know people are leaning in on is things like multi-armed bandits and optimizing for short-term metrics within machine learning. But where do you see, like right now, ChatGPT and AI is the big thing. And it it's, fits, people think it's a big cloud that will fit everywhere. I don't think when the dust settles, it'll fit everywhere. I think there's a piece of it that might fit into like helping prioritize ideas, help parse through data. Um, and perhaps there's a lot of machine learning that can be done on the stats side to shorten times to test. Um, perhaps auto like focusing your insights and generating the insights and you have to parse through that data. But like, where, where else do you guys see AI fitting neatly into supporting experimentation? I have two immediate good examples. And one I'm going to let Iqbal talk about because he's really on top of working on this. But the other one, and this was discussed fairly recently, was t um, turning ideas into hypothesis, hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So like taking someone, you know, like, because there's a right, there's a difference between here's an idea about something I'm interested in figuring out versus constructing the actual hypothesis for an experiment, right? Like a hypothesis has a specific formatting structure. It you know whether you're using if this then that or right. you know some other structure. So taking someone's idea of like here's something I want to try on the website or or whatever and actually turning that into a well written hypothesis. Yeah, and with the hypothesis is like, uh, you know, one of one of the one of the ways I've been uh, using it um, is to kind of help with my Airtable, kind of summarize stuff, uh, kind of like it, you know, instead of filling in all of these fields in the Airtable, uh, for instance, um, uh, people hypotheses written by people are just horrendous. Uh, they they it's just horrible. Um, so. But people in general right and, and yeah there's a there's a meta discussion there around like 
how to structure experimentation programs, you know, sure. center of excellence things and all that, right? Yeah, yeah. But if if you have like a decent template about how to write hypothesis, well, then all you need to do is to write out what the test details are, and then it it will write the hypothesis for you in a much better way. And I've tested that; it works really, really well. It works uh, better than you know a lot of human written uh, hypothesis would. And I think like you know, um, in because because one of the things with with in our space with CRO is that. We have to do a lot of stuff, right? We have to we have to know about uh, how, how to do data and analytics, how to uh, help the, you know have a lot of technical uh, insight, business insight, all this kind of stuff. But I think AI is going to be like an augmentation of that to help us uh, to help us not to help us do do that much much better in a way and. So I think rather than having, you know, people who are, who are experimenters who are purely developing tests, experimenters who are purely coming up with strategic stuff, I think experimenters are probably going to be overseeing the full thing with AI to support them. Do you guys think that AI will give a Dunning-Kruger type effect to experimentation people who think they're qualified but are really not to oversee and dunning kruger is like you're you have low confidence i'm sorry you have high confidence but low actual knowledge do you think it will empower people to uh incorrectly confident con confident but incorrectly overstate what they're doing so this is something persistent experimentation a lot of junior cro people believe like they know everything, but they very much don't. I was one of those. I thought I didn't think SRM was a thing. And then, you know, a year, a year into my career, I was like, oh, I can't just divide percentages. So perhaps AI might help create some guardrails there, which would be interesting. Um, and maybe that's built into tools. But I do think like it's the same convert. Like, have you guys used Wolfram Alpha? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in college, uh, I was taking a calc class and we had to do like put stuff into we had to like do homework for calculus and everyone would just plug in the equation on the thing plug it into wolfram get a number put it back and it was it was by bots for bots because a bot would just read this as a correct answer and then one day my professor like came in screaming at us like you, you guys don't know what you're doing you're just plugging this into a calculator this isn't the correct answer it is the correct answer to the bot, but this isn't the correct answer. And I think AI, just like you said, it'll help supplement those who are at the top tier, but I think it'll create a false, like, a false level of understanding to junior people that believe they could just plug in their test ideas into chat GPT and then plug it in and just be like a puppet master of chat gpt without actually being able to know what they're doing and why they're doing it or or even worse like ask gpt like what do you think the results of this test would be and then not even execute like oh, you're my, even like shortcutting I, the experimentation process oh entirely. you're right and i hate that oh there there no one's gonna run tests anymore there, there's tools that do that always uh, i'm not gonna oh, yeah. make any tools but there's there's tools that kind of like say oh yeah you should run this experiment this experiment is going to give you an x percent uplift uh etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, you should make this change this is percent you know there, there so like again it's like the whole users synthetic users sort of thing people people jumping ahead uh you know further than uh, where we are technologically and um, so yeah, that's going to happen, but it's an interesting point. Performing the process versus understanding the process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're just like, like thing goes in, thing comes out. I don't know what happens in the middle, but I, the, the, the output's all I'm concerned about. So whatever. I, it's funny. Have you guys watched Breaking Bad? Uh, I'm on the second season. Okay. I have not. I tried to get into it, but I have Oh I just my didn't God. Have time. I don't want to be on this. No, I didn't, I'm not saying anymore. I didn't like it or anything, but. Oh. Well, at least Iqbal's watching it again. I'm really watching it for the second time, and it's it's an incredible show, unrelated. One of the things that comes up, which you'll see very soon, Iqbal, is basically Walter is this chemist 
who understands how to synthesize meth from a bunch of different elements. And at some point, they're trying to like kill Walter White spoilers if you haven't seen it. It's kind of on you. It's been out for years. But at some <laughs> point, they're trying to kill Walter and then build it on their own. But they don't know the process. So they're trying to figure it out versus Walter White is the chemistry expert at the process. He understands and he's like, all right, well, if we don't have aluminum, I could just take these three elements found in a grocery store and that's the same thing because chemically it does these reactions and blah, blah, blah. That's where I think most people in experimentation should be, that you know how to do everything. But then, you know, perhaps you just follow a standard process and that'll get you good results. But you have to know how to pivot and where to adjust and, you know, move. You need to and know push. the rules yeah. to know when to break them, which, I mean, that's a general truism. True. Not specifically for experimentation anyway, True. right? Like there's the whole you know, installing Photoshop doesn't make you a graphic designer or it like, does it? you know, owning a camera doesn't make you a photographer. Posting there's, pictures. There's degrees of proficiency. But then, do you, but then again, have you seen like the, uh, I believe there was a photography competition, which the person who won it, uh, admitted that they used AI to generate the photograph. So was it specifically know. a photo photography competition or was it like, an yeah, art? I, I, I'm pretty sure it was a, like a specific photography competition and it's a photograph of two human subjects. If I remember, I've got it like. Fa hazy in my head. They must not have had like hands because it was probably before AI was good at hands. Also, photography is so subjective. I'm not going to lie. Like a photography competition is subjective versus an experimentation. There is an objective. This is better than the other with these numbers. So mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit different. But, but I think it could be even easier, right? If it's an objective. like. True. There's, there's, the, there's an output that can feed the, feed the chain, like, uh, you know, to go, to go into the, the data output, like it, it becomes an input to go into the next data. So I think, I think at some point. You, you have to be careful with that though, because it's like the old AI, point. like it's just gonna, it, right. It's just gonna go. And if there's not guardrails around, like it could go off in some really bizarre direction or, you know. Uh, perverse incentivization, right? Like if yeah. you're saying, hey, you know, like our, our, our goal is as many experiments as possible mm -hmm. um, and there's no, you know, qualifier there on like experiments need to be of a certain level of quality, quality defined as, you know, these specific, you know, measurable points, it's just going to start churning out bullshit experiments because its only goal is quantity. That's true of automation or not automation, right? Well, like, yeah, that's not yeah, right, 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 right. That's not a specific problem with AI. Like if you're running uh, in you, the wrong direction, it's easier to pay running versus the going AI is going to just yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. The AI is just going to take you faster in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you'll have to right. double and yeah, hundred percent. It's going to be harder and harder to to kind of uh, compete with the AI inspiration sort of thing. So. For instance, if you've, uh, uh, and, I, and I think this is where a seasoned CRO person would probably fare better, basically just coming up with ideas that are not kind of, oh yeah, just change the text of, of, this, uh, of this CTA, uh, but, ha but having a much more out of the box kind of thinking or thinking that's kind of, you know, not so cookie cutter. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's going to be, I, I think there's going to be a room for innovation, creativity that AI may not be able to match. I don't know. A, a quote that I picked up ages ago was like, strategy is knowing when to say no to something. And there's a component there of like, the, exp the experienced person knows like when to avoid something. And I'm going to go back to a very earlier example where we were talking about like using AI generated users to run usability testing sessions. Like 
an inexperienced person or someone with, that doesn't have deep CRO knowledge and experience could see that as a great, great way of, idea of like, oh, we can, we can do this. Like, like, you know, I don't have that many actual visitors on my site, but now I can use AI users to, to run experiments and optimization. But like the experienced person is going to see that and immediately recognize like, well, that's all just phantom false information. And it, it's like, it's just going to provide garbage output. And it, it, this is something that we should not. And the reason why do. is we think about experimentation, it has to be a representative sample of your users to extrapolate. So if a bot is your representative sample, i.e. you're optimizing for bots, you're in a good spot. But the people coming to your site that are buying are not bots. Although, I wonder, yeah, I was going to say, like, there might be some iRobot in the future where it will actually, you will, you will purchase a bot that will do everything for you. So then it's Bots optimizing for bots, which Craig Sullivan. <laughs> this, this, this is this is what I was uh, uh, getting to, and I was saying like uh, I think websites and browsers are going to change because because AI is going to be like oh uh, find me I'm I'm looking to buy a new uh, tape uh, find me the best tape or fridge or whatever uh, some shoes that I like and then it's it's going to come up with uh, you know all of the suggestions that you say yeah just buy get me these and just get me the cheapest price. So then the bot's going to take over. So then, in a way, the bots are going to be optimizing for bots. And it's the whole digital landscape is just going to be, there's going to be a layer, I think, which is going to be completely AI connecting to AI and discussing, like, you know, uh, hey, what, what shoes would Shiva, would Shiva like to wear? What, what T-shirt shall we get in next week? All that kind of stuff is, is all going to be, uh, is all going to be decided and purchased and kind of dispatched and delivered. Will yeah. we even have jobs? Like, what will we do? What's, the bots are going to be doing everything. What's What's the old joke? Like, Googling symptoms only tells you which diseases have the best SEO. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it's like it's like that kind of problem. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? I was. I think that was a. That was a good pessimistic uh, <laughs> note to lead things on. Like, well, what if we? So, so what if we take a couple seconds and go half glass half full here? I think. I think I'm. I'm. I'm bullish on the idea that basic things will be stuff that I don't necessarily have to do anymore, and I get to supervise my own little AI analyst bot that will help me parse through data. And then surface things that perhaps I didn't even have the time to go through. So as a person who is a strategist, I could spend more time in strategy and less on building a report to get what I need. Yeah, and there's um, like, like human focuses on quality, AI focuses on quantity. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so I'm bullish sure. on that. I like the, I, I like the opportunity to be able to focus a lot more on strategy, which I think will be tremendous for people who understand the process. And I think that's more in the vein of everyone needs to know what they're doing to be able to leverage AI in the best way possible. And I think yeah. it'll ultimately help. For those yeah. who are looking for it to be the augmentation, like you said, I'm bullish on it, man. Yeah, because I think with it, uh, like I said, with, uh, with GitHub Copilot, Code Whisperer, those are our immediate future. Where basically they're just like helpers to. It is essentially like Copilot. There's no better uh, sort of uh, branding than that. Is kind of like what what AI is going to be to us. Is we are going to have our Copilot to help us to do things and take over some of the repetitive tasks, so we can free ourselves to do other stuff. I mean, there's like you know we're talking about dystopian features, but there's also like the Star well, the new Star Trek is is all dystopian, but the old Star Trek is uh, is kind of like you know uh, human replicators and holodecks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because uh, because AI is you know it, it can take over a lot of the mundane tasks, so we can focus on on creativity and you know doing things that AI can't do that only we can do. Um, Along the lines of like talking about like GitHub Copilot and stuff, do you do you think it could ever get to a point? where it's like 
here's my test idea that I want to execute on. And then the AI can actually write the variation code for you. I, I think it's, it's a distinct possibility that if you've got enough in like Copilot X is going to look at your entire project and it's going to give you some code based on the entire project. So if you've got the data in there, in your project, um, I think there is a distinct possibility that it could, you know, maybe in a couple of years or whatever, you could give it to say, you know, I want I see Shiva shaking his head. I don't. I don't. The only reason why is because every site I've been a part of client or agent, you know, whatever internal or agency side has built the site in a massively different way and had its own unique set of problems, its own tech stack. The only way I think that works is if like everyone websites ever goes to like a Shopify template and like everyone is built on the same stack with the same technology, same everything, then AI can jump in and be like, all right, Here's how you're, um, here's how the site's built. And then here's how we can manipulate. But I don't think anyone will ever get to that point. I think but what, what if I... you could get that context? So say for, for instance, what if you could say, cause AI is very good at summarizing code and kind of, uh, um, uh, sort of like, uh, adding quotes, uh, uh, and kind of messages on code and stuff like that. So what if you could get the developers to say, Hey, can you get me an output? from your application code to just describe everything, all of the functions, everything, all of the stuff that is working. And then that gets input into the AI for you to then use as context. Because basically if you've got the, if the AI is given the right context, it can do it. So it's getting that context. And if there is a path to getting that context, either doing the uh, experiment server side or getting them to output all of this kind of documentation, uh, that can be input. I think it's, it's probably doable, probably like, Counterpoint. do you trust WYSIWYG? No, no. Game but WYSIWYG is nice. different from AI. I don't, I don't think it's that much. I don't, I think the same concept still applies that it, mm -hmm. if Wiz, if you don't trust WYSIWYG, do you trust an AI to accomplish the same type of thing? in the same way without creating bugs. One of the, one a, of the things that I don't like about the WYSIWYG is that if you've got IDs that are uh, um, automatically generated, it will, it will, you know, very, it's a blunt force kind of uh, way of doing it. AI, it can know that these div IDs are automatically generated and it's got that context and it can work around it. So I think the, the AI is going to be like the next smart evolution of the WYSIWYG, basically. Yeah. I don't trust WYSIWYG and I don't trust AI, but if you mush them to the <laughs> two of them together. Dude, that's hey, what I'm now you got, now I, you got a power. Totally, Matt yeah. summarized it exactly right. I feel the same exact way. I, I, I don't trust WYSIWYG. I think AI is an augmentation. So I think it's better than nothing, but it's not perfect. You're taking two mushed bananas, squishing them together and hoping it creates a brand new thing. It's not, it's just, a, it's just two mushed bananas. Two There's mushed bananas mushed together makes a decent banana. I'm surprised that you, you, yeah, you that just makes a bigger banana. It just makes a bigger mush. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, gray goo, except it's banana goo. No, there's, there's a difference there between like, and. A, a, with a, with both AI and WYSIWYG, like WYSIWYG as is, is trying to be general purpose. And that's why it sucks. Like if it was a WYSIWYG that was purpose built for a specific instance and, you know, it's in a controlled environment of like, if I do this thing in the WYSIWYG, it writes the code this way for this specific site that can probably actually be manageable because right there's a controlled environment probably same yeah, thing also... with ai right like yeah it's not a like it's not useful for general purpose you have to ha it has to have like boundaries and and focus and constraint oh yeah, yeah you give it the context to then work in the specific uh uh sort of project i I'd also I'd say it's... With cool, by the way. i'd say like if it's a website built by ai and then you have 
another AI that's part of the suite of AI that then adds stuff to the AI built website. It like it's the same reason why I think um, like auto driving cars is a terrible idea until it's a really good idea, because until every car is auto driving, it's just going to have problems. But if everything is auto driven, then they will all be able to talk to each other in the best way possible. And I don't think you're going to get to that point for a long time. Cool. I've, I've got to do the school run, by the way. So, but it was a, it was a great chat. If, I'm going to drop out for the outro, if that's okay, because I need to. All right, no need problem. To cool. Nice, nice uh, chatting to you. We need to do this again. This was really fun. Absolutely. Yeah. You can come on more often. Yeah. I'm more than happy to. And this is fun. See ya. Okay, that's it. Yeah, so if y'all have uh, any questions or feedback for either me, Iqbal, or Shiva, you can always, uh, well, at least you can talk to me and Iqbal face-to-face -face at the at the roundtable every Friday. Uh, Shiva's optional, up to, up to you whether you want to join. You're shaming me into coming. No, not at all, not at all. Uh, it's, it's open invite. Anybody's allowed to come whenever they want. Uh, you can always hit us up at conversionworld.co. If you're shy or you don't like speaking, uh, you can connect with any of us on LinkedIn. Thanks, everybody. We'll catch you next time.